Um, so how many of you have been to a conference where you have seen the talk about how constraints are so awesome for design? Yeah, yeah I, I, see a few, I see a few hands, right? Um, some of you have probably even read the 37 Signals book. Um, uh, I'm not going to give you that talk. Um, I'm going to give you the talk about what happens uh, when constraints vanish or go awry. And uh, when somebody... Um, it is not likely that you are actually going to go voluntarily adopt a crocodile, more likely uh, it is going to get dumped in your lap and you're going to have to figure out what to do with it. Um, so uh, I presume this guy is drunk, so he would fit in right here. <laughs> um, I told, uh, you know, I think like Katie, I'm a professional translator, really. Uh, I survived as a lawyer because I was the guy who could understand. Uh, I worked on the Google Oracle trial as the guy who understood how Android was developed, right? Uh, explaining that uh, for, for the record, uh, for Google lawyers, uh, if there's any Oracle people here, <laughs> um, so, 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 like I said on the uh, uh, on the opening talk, this is about very open platforms, right? So we all, I think, have some idea. Everybody in this room probably has some idea of an open platform. I asked for an illustration of this on Twitter. I got this. That's not, that's not quite what I meant. Um, uh, I, oh, I forgot my, so I actually, my day job these days is as a, uh, I, I head the volunteer engagement department uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a nonprofit that supports Wikipedia. Uh, so I, I heard passwords. Um, and um, so, so if you see a citation in the best of work, that means we see it. Um, so, uh, so work defines an open platform as a platform that allows things to function in ways other than that originally intended by the programmer, right? But in an open, pro in an open platform, traditionally, users get to play up here, right? They don't necessarily they don't get to create new APIs for themselves. They don't get to create new data storage. You know, when I'm using sales, Salesforce, I can add some new things for myself, but I can't break it for other people. So a very open platform, um, I'm going to define that for the purposes of this talk as where one person can change everybody's platform. So I'm going to give Sam a heart attack here by saying, so what if I, as a Salesforce user, could you know, I don't think all the rest of you Salesforce users, that, that data field is really overrated. You guys should just drop it, right? Um, imagine the chaos that would result. So I'm here to tell you about some platforms where, in fact, exactly that kind of thing can happen, right? Uh, the reminder is do not try this at home, right? Do not run home. I'm not here to tell you you should go home and, you know, go, go back to work on Monday and say, you know what, all of your users should be able to change all of your fields and create their own APIs. That is not the takeaway. The takeaway is, should your boss tell you that on Monday, uh, you will have at least some options other than running streaming. Uh, the running streaming is probably still the right answer. Um, uh, so I'm going to start with, uh, since we are all lawyers here, uh, I'm going to start with the comment. Uh, all right, let's try this again. We're going to start with your law. Um, so uh, how many of you are familiar with the German beer purity law? All right. Um, this is uh, also the Germans will call it a right height to box. I learned to pronounce that just for you, Stephen. <laughs> um, uh, so if you know anything about the right height to you probably know it's a it's the Bavarian beer purity law. It dates back to 1516, and it says that beer should only contain three ingredients, right? It should have water, barley, and hops. That's what's the law in Bavaria, right? So in this sense, the Run Heights Cabal is an open platform, right? It gives you some constraints. It says this is what you can work within, uh, and it allows you a lot of diversity on top if you're a brewer, right? Not, not enough. Uh, perhaps to make modern German beer all that interesting, but relatively speaking, a pretty good place to start, right? Um, and it's not just our flexible that's actually an open platform in this sense. It is uh, all law that's an open platform. Uh, and in fact, uh, you probably don't want to think about it this way, but the law is actually the oldest platform that your business depends on, right? And so a lot of the wonkiness of it is that you can actually think of lawyers as 
helping you understand what an API is, right? Because it's not very well documented. Um, so in, my sense of, in the sense of my talk today, the Red Hexabud is actually a very open platform because uh, actually all the stuff I told you about it earlier is a lie. Um, so the first lie, excuse me, um, the first lie is that it's not just Bavaria, right? Uh, so this gentleman up here is uh, Albert the Fourth. He was the Duke of Bavaria when uh, in 1516. So he tends to get the credit for the uh, for the beer law. Um, it's not actually true, right? So the first the first European beer laws that we know of were in Belgium. Uh, there was a whole bunch of them even in Germany before uh, 1516. Since then, it got stolen by Greeks. And uh, most recently, the court in Luxembourg, which is in a building like this, that Albert would not have dreamed of in his wildest dreams, said in 1993, yeah, your beer law is sort of protection of the And uh, so they more or less got rid of it, right? Um, and so the takeaway number one is that when you have a really open platform like this, control can happen in all kinds of ways and places that you did not anticipate. Right? Uh, when, you, when it is truly crazily open like that, in the case of the law, anybody with an army can come in and interrupt uh, in our circumstances, and we'll talk about this some more in other examples, there's a lot of different ways uh, that control can happen. So line number two about the German beer law, you've all heard 1516. If you look closely at this label, it says 1487, so that may be confusing. That's because Munich, uh, the city which is in Bavaria, if you ask them, somebody from Munich, they'll say 1487. The rest of Bavaria will tell you 1516. That's, again, some guys with armies got into it. That sort of, you know, that, that's how platform change happens when you're a lawyer is armies. Uh, there's also 1293, which was some other little town. Uh, in the 1800s, the Greeks borrowed it. And like I said, in 1993, uh, in Luxembourg, um, uh, the judges ruled it uh, unconstitutional under European law. Um, it, this is another sign the law is a very open platform, right? It lives and breathes in this way. There's no one saying, this is the API, it's defined, go play within that space, right? It changes on an ongoing basis. And that's takeaway number two. If you have a very open platform that allows people to tweak it, they will, right? Because they will see new needs, uh, new problems, and they will fix it, right? Whether or not you think it's a fix is something you will have to wrestle with, right? Um, by comparison, the English common law uh, arguably dates back to 1160. The first attempt to refactor it was in 1923. Um, so 750 years of crust is not good. Um, but, but that story, I can tell you over more beer later. So the third lie, uh, hops, barley, water, um, we didn't know about wheat. Uh, so that sort of had to get added in later. And, uh, and even within a few decades of 1516, they were like, oh yeah, grew it. You like grew it? You, you want some extra flavors in there? Yeah, sure, go ahead, right? Um, and so they've been changing, actually, this list of ingredients pretty much since as soon as it was written down, right? It is German marketers who want to sell you good, solid, boring German beer, but put a nice historical wrapper on it. It's those marketers who are telling you that this is nice and simple and straightforward, right? So takeaway number three is that when Louis Pasteur, uh, well, he doesn't invent yeast, he discovers yeast and says, oh, hey, there's some of this in beer, uh, these outside facts are going to change what's going on in your platform, again, whether you like it or not. So let's talk about another series of rules and law, right? Um, where instead of having an army uh, to change the rules for you, all you need is a few hundred million bucks and a thousand developers or so, right? Uh, so that you can write a web browser. Um, it is just as political, though, uh, and nearly as violent uh, for those of you who've been involved in standards battles. That's what we were going to have the cage match now. It was going to be open standards. Um, HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS, as most of you in this room probably know, have been developed as an open collaborative standard, right? And so this is supposed to be a, like, kumbaya thing. We're all arm in arm moving the web forward. Uh, again, those of you who have actually been involved know that that is... <clears throat> Uh, you know, charitably not not true, right? Um, so it's actually, it's not just an open platform in the way I define it, but it is very open, right? Because the browser vendors uh, can change the platform arbitrarily, right? Um, so they can change not just the top level that we are working at, but they can change the bottom levels as well. And uh, this story is frequently told as a horror story, right? 
Uh, those of you who are so active developers, this is caniuse.com, and it tells you the state of the adoption of, uh, of, of APIs, right? And it tells you that even in the best case, you get 85% of HTML5 in modern browsers. And in the worst case, you get 7%, right? And this is often told as a story of, oh, it's a very open platform, it's not controlled by one vendor, so therefore it's a nightmare, right? Um, but I'm going to tell a slightly different story, right? So XML HTTP requests was the beginning of the modern web, right? It was not created by committee. It was not created by, you know, kumbaya moment where IE and Opera and Mozilla sat down together, right? IE said, man, we've got to make that look work in a web browser, <laughs> um, which is like the worst motivation of all time, right? <laughs> um, However, nevertheless, they made it happen, right? And the way they did it was by creating this new feature that started off in IE. Mozilla copied it because, like, I don't know, it won't hurt. Um, and, uh, and then Google was like, oh, hey, we can build a pretty cool map with this, right? And, um, uh, and that literally changed everything, right? This somewhat hostile, I mean, because at the time, Microsoft was regarded I think correctly as an enemy of the web, but I will still fight anybody who tells me that Bill Gates is uh, not a super villain, right? Because he stole from all of us. Uh, he's doing all kinds of awesome stuff in Africa, yay, but let's not pretend, right? Um, and so these super villains dive in and said, we're going to break the web in this pretty cool way, right? And uh, and that created the modern web, right? That switched us from a web of you got to reload or click a link every time you want new data to, uh, to this dynamic platform that we know today, right? And so that's takeaway number four. It's not just that outside innovation can change your platform. It can change it in really deep, really unpredictable, right? Because even Microsoft didn't really realize what they'd done at the time, right? And in good ways, right? Um, and, you know, open innovation is good. It's, it's almost a mantra in the, in the industry these days, right? Um, that's why we all have APIs, whether or not we know what people are going to do with them, right? But I want to remind you here that it's not just above the API level that innovation can happen, right? It's below it uh, as well if you let it or if it's forced on you. Um, so it's not just the, the browser vender to break HTML, I mean, communicate in HTML, right? Uh, it's because the fine folks in this room, uh, I believe this is from 2014, um, we're all public, like, how many of you put stuff on the internet, right? Like, presumably pretty much all of you. Stephen's raising his hand over here, uh, 71 HTML errors on their mom.com. Um, <laughs> uh, and, I, 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 uh, I strongly suspect most of us would do uh, work. I, uh, um, my team was doing my Alex, so, uh, um, so I've got no errors. But, um, but yeah, I don't, that's not a solution for everybody, right? In theory, and, and see, I promise you and I would get Beer Purity Law and Postel's Law on the same slide. I'm sorry, I did not quite thread that needle, but, um, you know, the web in theory follows Postel's Law, right? We're being liberal in what we accept and we're being conservative, we're being standards compliant in what we publish. Again, as I've already said, this is, this is junk, right? In reality, we have all kinds of errors in our HTML and in our CSS. Um, JavaScript's a little better because it's a little more tightly controlled, but not necessarily, right? Web pages are such junk that the junk is now part of the standard, right? This guy, this is Ian Hickson. He's been described to me as a standard savant. Uh, I believe the person was being polite when they did not say idiot savant because he is just, uh, and he decided when he was helping rewrite HTML as HTML5 uh, that a thing he needed to do was to get Google to scour the web to look at hundreds of billions of web pages uh, to find out what was broken, right? So that we could definitively say, oh, ordered lists are broken in exactly this kind of way 80% of the time. And so HTML no longer tells you just what to emit. It also tells you how to ingest it, right? Because we admitted in our standard after mm, 10, 15 years of HTML that we had better rewrite the thing to cope with that reality, right? Um, and that brings us to an interesting point, right? Very open platforms, they are often thrust upon you because control is impossible, 
right? If we had invented the printing press, right, and if we had one army controlling all of Europe, as we de facto now do in, in the European Union, right, we wouldn't have had a different beer law in Munich and a different beer law in Nuremberg and a different beer law in, a different beer law in Belgium, right? We would have passed one, we would have printed up hundreds of thousands of copies of it, and we would have passed it around, right? Um, and instead, because we didn't have that technology, we didn't have that control, we got the system of letting a thousand flowers bloom because we didn't have any other options, right? We hadn't invented a weed whacker yet. We couldn't cut down the other 999 flowers. And HTML is the same thing, right? We had not, we don't all sit in the same public, with the same publishing tools. We don't all necessarily have the same browser. Uh, and so very open platforms happen to us whether we want to or not. Right? And the corollary of this is that if you get, if a very open platform has thrust upon you, the very first thing you should do is what Ian Hickson did and say, holy cow, what do I need to do? Like, what is it that's actually happening under my nose here? Right? Because I have instincts, but these instincts are probably wrong. Um, you know, again, because this often happens by accident, like, most people, right, if you're building a modern platform, you instrument the heck out of it, right? Like, that's step one. That's part of you do, part of what you do as you're building it. But very open platforms, like I said, rarely come about by choice. They tend to get thrust upon you, right? So should somebody come bearing a gift of an alligator, it's really nice, right? The first thing you do is count how many teeth it has. Um, so let me take you to my final uh, example, right? Um, everybody knows that Wikipedia is the encyclopedia that anyone can edit, right? Like that is what we are famous for. That leads to all kinds of stories. Several beers in, you can ask me about penis paintings tonight. Um, some of you already heard that story. Um, uh, it, you know, in, in rape story, uh, the, you know, these get sucked into the engine and uh, we, the awesome thing is that we had a crash landing. At some level, Wikipedia working is we got sucked into the engine and the passengers invented teleportation before it hit the water, right? Like, this thing shouldn't work, and yet it does. Uh, and here's the thing, right? It's not a dirty secret. It's something that a lot of people don't actually understand, and what I want to spend the rest of this talk on is that it's actually the platform where anyone can create a new data structure. Right? That is an underappreciated aspect of our chaos and anarchy, right? Because uh, the volunteers aren't just writing the content, they're writing the data structure that it is stored in. And this leads to two seemingly contradictory facts, right? We are the world, depending on how you want to count, uh, biggest or second biggest behind the Google Knowledge Graph store of curated information in the world, and we are a total mess, right? And the curated and the mess should seem to be intention, and yet they're not. So to bring it back to here, uh, this is the very first version of the article about Budweiser. Um, and you will notice there's not a lot of structure here, right? It is literally a numbered list, and it's not even like it. That's a hand-numbered list. There's no OL tag in there, right? Um, you will see no citations. You will see no info box. You'll see no T also, right? All these things were invented later. Right? The encyclopedia did not, we did not roll this out of the box and say, oh, well, we're building an encyclopedia, so maybe we should add some citations, right? We didn't really invent citations for three years. Uh, I mean, we knew what they were, right? Uh, but we didn't have a standard way of doing them. Uh, and so what we've done, what we did was we handed the community the ability to create templates, right? Which are essentially our form of data stores, of data structures. So you look here, you see the Familiar citation, you see a sort of see also box, you see the standard, you know, you've all seen a million of these uh, boxes of information. All of those were created from scratch by the community. Uh, this structure happened entirely organically. And uh, yeah, sometimes it, it, it looks organic once you look under the hood. So I mentioned citations earlier. Um, our official style guide, when you ask it, well, how do I do citations? It lists eight different ways of doing it. Um, and that's just in English. The Germans have a different way, the French have a different way, the Italians have a different way. I'm sure the Germans have ten, um, but I, it always hurts me to look. So, um, 
And that's, you know, and so that's one way in which we've grown up organically, right? And it's hurt us, and it, it is simultaneously great, right? It allowed people from different academic backgrounds to do exactly whatever, our, if they're MLA people, they can use MLA in articles they're working on. If they're, what, what, what's your preferred, preferred citation format? Yeah. All right, yeah, if you want to do Chicago style, you can do Chicago style. I mean, you might get an argument about it, but it's acceptable. Um, so when I had a meeting with a partner who said, yeah, I'd love to support your citations, right? Tell me about your citation API. And then I cried. And, um, uh, and, and, and I, he said, well, what, you know, well, it's just a big blob of text. I said, well, we can write a text parser. Like, you know, tell me about, well, there are eight different formats. And just in English. And then he cried. And then, um, <laughs> and then we did not reach a partnership. Um, so there's a happy ending to that one. Hopefully, I'll have time to get to it. Um, similarly, we need to store licensing information about the images we have. Right? This Budweiser image, we have not, we do not have a contract with Budweiser to use that. Right? We were, we rely on fair use. And so again, a template, a blob of ugly-looking text. It's how we store this licensing information. Right? There's no API. It's made up on the fly, uh, which allowed us to do both things like Budweiser. Uh, the same publisher conversation, he said, surely you all have a licensing API. I said, no, blah, blah, text. Well, how many licenses do you have? You know, five, six, seven. Well, we can't really count, but we think it's around 900. Um, and then we both cried again. And um, it used to be that my favorite example uh, of random licensing information on Wikipedia was public domain of Brazilian Navy because we had a letter on file from the Brazilian Navy that, oh yeah, pictures of our trips on our website for public domain. But in researching this talk, I came across public domain Manchukuo stamps, which is, uh, that's the name of the government, the Japanese occupation government in China from 1931 to 1945. Since the government no longer exists, the stamps are in the public domain. And uh, someone who's really concerned with Chinese stamps created this bit of licensing information. <laughs> and so now, if you really need to know which pieces of, of images on our site, about a dozen, uh, are in the public domain with any copyright held by the now defunct government has expired pursuant to Article 21 of the Copyright Law of the People's Republic of China. Um, you really need to know that now you know, right? There's also a whole category for those of you who saw Monkey Selfie last year. There's a whole category for public domain created by non-human animals. Very specific <laughs> that animals are human, that humans are animals too. So it's very specifically not just public domain animals. <laughs> the takeaway from this is that, as with anything, premature optimization is an evil, right? Um, it's a problem not just for data, for, for code, which we are all, of course, taught about in, you know, in for CS, right? But it's a problem for data, too, right? Had somebody asked when we started this thing, Jimmy Wales, super bright guy, would not have said, yeah, Japanese stamps produced during, between the wars. And that would not have come to mind, right? Um, and yet, it's proved useful. Um, and that leads to the pairing, takeaway number nine, refactoring does help. Right? If I were going to rewrite the licensing system from scratch, we probably would not maintain that tag, right? We'd split it up, we'd refactor it. Um, and so refactoring is, again, not just a code thing. When you're dealing with super open platforms where anybody can even rewrite your data structures, you've got to be on top of all of these things, right? And that's also a corollary of the earlier one of simply understand what's going on, right? What are people modifying? Where are they innovating? Uh, since it's your platform, you may not be able to stop them from innovating, but you can at least look around and see what's being done, right? And you can put your finger on the scales uh, and help people uh, refactor, right? And here's the thing, right? This messy data powers the world. That box I showed you earlier, uh, manufacturer Anheuser-Busch InBev, country of origin, introduced, that's all direct from us, right? Like, it's messy, it's ugly, uh, but it works. Um, you'll notice it has the pronunciation information there. I fixed that. It's scary. It took Google about 10 minutes after I, I took the screenshot, fixed, removed the pronunciation from this because it's in the wrong place, uh, and it took Google 10 minutes to pick it up, right? Here's a, I added this slide uh, after Brady's talk this morning. 
Who wants to guess what percentage of changes uh, made to Wikipedia get reverted? Right? We, we, know, we know that YouTube comments are a cesspool. Frankly, most of us have probably turned off comments on our blog. Every beer-related change I've ever made has been reverted. <laughs> Does anybody want to go go lower? No, no, lower, lower. I heard an eight. Oh, that was. I thought that was a point one on top of the seventy. Uh, it, it's depending on how you want to count between two and three percent. So ninety-seven. We've created, in some sense, the world's biggest, most visible graffiti wall. And in fact, the vast majority of the changes to it are positive, right? Um, and we don't train anybody. There's no like I mean, we train some people, right? But there are millions of edits, so we're training hundreds of people. Um, and that leads me to my last takeaway, right? Our instinct as technologists is that constraints have to be technical, right? We design uh, user interface affordances. We design API affordances. We say this is how we're going to control people through our technical means, right? Um, and this is a big reminder that, in fact, culture and social enculturation matter a lot. And the reason this is uh, illustrated with uh, the Britannica, right, is a part of why we get that 97% number is that, at least in the uh, industrialized Western world, everybody knows what the encyclopedia is, right? And so people, when they are editing, they have this sense of what's the encyclopedic tone, what's a neutral fact, how do we do that, right? Uh, that's sort of baked in. And so when you're thinking about uh, these open platforms, any of them, not just very open platforms, think not just about your avenues for technical control, but think also about your avenues for acculturation, right? For how you help people help you. Because um, that's, it, it, it's sort of crazy that it works for us, but it does. So conclusions, um, do not pet the alligator, right? Um, uh, if somebody offers you an alligator, you, you probably really don't want it. Um, if the alligator is thrust upon you though, right? There are silver linings, look for them, try to find them. Understand what's going on, monitor, right? Lean on the cultural, because if somebody has taken away the technical, uh, you know, that, that tool is still available to you, even though we tend to think of ourselves as technologists first. Finally, buckle up. It's going to be a fun ride, right? Um, it, it may be a little crazy. It may, I'm, I'm not guaranteeing good endings. The alligator may take a, a finger or, you know, a little more. If they take a can of Coors Light, it's okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, it, it, it can be a lot of fun. So that's, uh, that's my talk. Thank you.